you pray with me? Only God help us to translate the words of the song, the words from our lips to our innermost being, so that we can begin to believe that we are part of your sacred love. That's the gift of the gospel. Not only are we part of your sacred love, but so is the rest of creation. Give us the courage and the eyes and heart to live into the truth that Jesus revealed. It's in his name and spirit that we pray and say together, Amen. So I'm working on a sermon series, um, and just a quick recap, our primary resource is Worship Design Studio, which is done by Dr. Martha McPhee. And a um, quick review of where we've been so far. We're in week four. First week was population two. For those of you who don't know what that, well, how many of you know what that's a picture of? Yeah, Grand Central Station. If you've ever been to Grand Central Station, it does sort of feel like it's in focus and out of focus because there's so much happening. Population two, that was the first week. I try to stay awake was the second. Last week, Beth preached on what really matters because I don't want to miss it. And I want to take just a minute to call attention um, to the lovely table and the way in which our overall theme of outside my own little world combined with each theme of each week is connected to the thread song. Some of us are keen on making those connections and some of us miss it. So I wanted to connect the dots today and thank Nancy McPherson and, and Kathy Toma because they are the artists behind what we have been enjoying each week on the communion table. And I just want to call your attention to the way in which look me in the eye is addressed because there are masks up there, and we know sometimes it's hard to look each other in the eyes. And the masks are actually from Africa. The, the rug is from Turkey. The globes, as you can imagine, are to lift up World Communion Sunday. Look me in the eye is our focus for today. I also would encourage you to, to um, bear in mind that, that we're trying to hold the visuals, they appear on the table, and then they appear up on the upper ledge, just in case you've forgotten where we are. And if it gets too crowded up there, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Look me in the eye. I picked this scripture, it was actually the secondary scripture suggested um, by Marsha McPhee, because it's, it's such a profound story. And if you're just kind of waking up and your second or third cup of coffee hasn't kicked in yet, this is an extremely profound and troubling parable. And we can sort of gloss over it. But here's, what, here's what's going on. First of all, you ask, who was Jesus telling this parable to? He was telling the parable to the people in power who thought they could make decisions about who belonged in the kingdom of God. So you always have to ask yourself, who is it that Jesus is speaking to? Figure that out first, and then how is it that Jesus is speaking to me? So Jesus was speaking to um, probably a bunch of pompous men who thought that they knew everything. Can I get a witness on that? <laughs> what is a parable? A parable is a tool that Jesus used to teach. It's kind of a story. And here's the problem with parables. The kingdom of God may be compared to, and unfortunately, lots of times, biblical scholars and those of us who look at the Bible think that we can completely figure out what each of these characters means. And in this story, it starts off a king through a banquet, a wedding banquet for his son. 
Those who like to have everything figured out go, oh, the king must be God, and the son must be Jesus, and all those people who acted out must be the ones that God doesn't like. It is to be compared with, not equal to, to give us room to figure out what is that parable trying to say to us today. Otherwise, it becomes so codified that we know the answers to everything and everybody's problems, and then we can start pointing at them. Can I get a witness on that? So here are the key pieces of this story. There was the invitation. The king sends out his, his slaves and says, invite the people who are supposed to be here. And of course, they, they make light of it. Not only do they make light of it, some of them actually um, mistreat the slaves and some are killed. Remember, the kingdom of God is like. Because then what the king does? The king says, hey, if you're going to kill my slaves, I'll send my soldiers out and I'll kill you guys. Retribution. This is why it may be compared to. <clears throat> then, after he's wiped out all those people, the king says, well, go and bite some more people. And of course, what the story says is that they went out and they invited everybody because that's what the king said. Go out and invite everyone. And the text says the good and the bad. So just when we thought we knew what God wanted at the beginning of this text, Jesus turns it upside down and says, hey, guess what? If you think it was good and bad, you may be wrong. invite us to come to conclusions for ourselves. So, from my perspective, the major takeaway for us today is who is worthy? Who has value? Who do we pay attention to? I don't know about you, but it was a fairly contentious and difficult week for me. And I have both images up here because both were at work. Both show the huge discrepancy between who is worthy and who is valuable and who you pay attention to. And it depends on which glasses we're looking through. myself wondering how it is that we as people are going to find ways to reconcile because this past few weeks has driven a wedge and has really made it difficult to be in communion, especially with people who see the world completely differently than we do. And my guess is there is that difference in this community even as we speak. The last time I knew something radical happened that required reconciliation was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I love this quote, resentment's like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. And so the key aspects of truth and reconciliation are listen, witness, and share. Now I have both Beth Astarte and Janine Elliott to thank for the lifting up of will it take between men and women a truth and reconciliation process and do we have the guts and the courage to actually walk through that? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm beginning to think that's what it's going to take. Otherwise, we're just going to keep yelling at each other, distrusting each other. I think we need to start with some typical gender stereotypes. That might be one of the first ways to move into this territory of how is it that men and women have honest conversation. So I just want to call out a few aspects of, of this image. 
First of all, I love chocolate. Here it is over here in the female brain. I know some women who really like sex. It's over here in the male brain. How about the shopping load? Really? My wife would rather have a root canal than go shopping. <laughs> Any other women here rather have a root canal than go shopping? Okay, and how many times do we fall into these stereotypes and kind of find ourselves, oh, we know boys will be boys. Oh, we know that women, all they want is warm fuzzies. That continues the problem. Now, the reality is, stereotypes typically point to one small piece of truth. Unfortunately, they get blown out of proportion, so they become the whole truth. So here's a slide that, that I found. I actually, the first line says, focus on difference between men and women. I think what I would say is acknowledge and celebrate the real differences between men and women because there are real differences. Unfortunately, the stereotypes are the ones that typically define what those differences are. And they may or may not be very helpful. Make women's lives visible. Shift perspective from male as universal to women as legitimate. And I put the slide up there with letter D because we have to figure out what D is. Oh boy, I see a lot of people wondering what the heck this is going to be about. Outside my own little world, right? Some of that's about gender. You know, we could also substitute on that slide, focus on the difference between blacks and whites, rich and poor. We could put all of those dichotomies that we live with up there. And I think it's really important because we've come a long way with, with our children and what they can expect to do and what they can't expect to do, but we need to keep working at it. We need to keep working at it because some of those stereotypes pigeonhole people into things that they may or may not be gifted in doing or equipped to do. Listen, witness, and share. There are signs of hope. If you saw the Oregonian yesterday, you know that the Nobel Peace Prize were awarded. And um, this is a fellow who is a surgeon in the Republic of Congo, and he has spent his whole life serving, repairing, healing, um, primarily women who have been assaulted. And you can imagine how difficult that is in the Republic of Congo. And here is one person, at least, who is willing to say, there has to be a change in the way women are treated. This woman was, and I was trying to remember the time frame, I, I've forgotten it, but um, the Islamic State kidnapped um, a, a, a large number of young women from Iraq, the Yazidi women, and this young woman was one of those who was abducted. And she has spoken out in a kind of profound way at great risk to say, this has been my experience. And we need to do something about it so we can have healthy relationships between men and women. Now, I always like to add a little bit of outside my own world story to these because why should I ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself? So I prepare my sermons, as you know, at the Hillsborough Library. And as I approached the library yesterday, I saw a familiar face. This is Sharia Ahmed. He's actually, that's not a very handsome picture of him. He uh, is the president of the Law Mosque. And back in 2000, when uh, the first 9-11 happened, Bethel was the first church to reach out to Bilal Mosque and say, we know all Muslims are not terrorists. So Shariar saw me outside, and I saw him, but I saw him before he did, and I thought, boy, I know I've got to get this sermon done, I've got to get down to help out with the rummage sale, and can I get a witness on this? Is it a little bit like the, the, the Good Samaritan story, is like, do I stop? Or do I keep going so I can honor my other commitments? And I made a conscious choice. I'm stopping. I'm going to live outside my own little world. I went over there, wonderful. And Shariar's like, uh, we have got to get our communities uh, talking again. 
And I said, absolutely. He said, if you give me your cell phone number, I will send you a text right now. We will be linked. And I did. And he did. And we are. Okay. There's always a exhibit A. There's exhibit B. Went into the room, all the tables with power. I have to plug my laptop in. All of them were taken by the time I got there. And it, there's always this sort of, do I sit with somebody who's already at the table? Am I gonna, uh, any of you ever had that struggle? So there's one table with one Asian woman sitting at it, working very hard. This is not her, I was not stupid enough to take a picture. <laughs> this is representing a young Asian student who was at the table, I, I said, may I join you? She said, yeah, sure, sure. I sat down. She stayed for 15 minutes. She got up and left, and I thought, well, maybe she's all finished. When I went up to get a drink of water, she had relocated to another place. There's something about white privilege and being male that can be intimidating, even if you're not intending to be. I've taken a shower and everything, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> uh, And I don't know if it's got anything to do with me or not. Maybe, maybe she was cold and wanted to go. But it made me stop and think, was this person uncomfortable simply by my presence? <clears throat> So illustration two for being outside my own little world, and this happens to be what we did this past week. All of us who volunteered got outside of our own little worlds and decided that we would set aside some time and do something that was good for Bethel and for the community. We got outside of our own little world, and as you can see from this picture, there were so many people who came from the community who don't look like us. And I had a remarkable thing happen. There's been a guy who's been coming over the last year, and he asks me for money, and I almost never give anybody cash, but for some reason, this guy felt legit, and I've given him cash, and I gave him, I bought him some shoes and a jacket on Friday, and he said, I will come and pay you back, Pastor. If I had a nickel for every person who had said that, we would be able to replace the boiler now. <laughs> When I arrived to help clean up at 3 o'clock, Liz Pack handed me 60 bucks and said, the fellow that you helped yesterday came back, and even though you only gave him $20, he remembered that you had given him a 20 and a 20 before that, so here's the 60 bucks. That's never happened. <laughs> never happened. And there are some... The whole congregation is responsible for this, but there are some people who go above and beyond, and Carolyn Rundorf is one of them, and Kathy Tomer, they were sort of the primary recruiters, and then Linda Timmel was here, I think, from dawn to dusk, or before that, all week long. In fact, I got back with Greg Johnson last night at 7 o'clock, and she and Sue Scott were cleaning up the church. <laughs> Just remember how much it falls on the shoulders of some people, and there's George and Boing, there is Sue Scott, and it's really George and Liz, and this picture's from the, the directory, and this is Liz right here, I was trying to decide, <laughs> should, should I put Liz here and George over? Anyway, it's, it's a Liz and George show, where are they? I know they're here someplace. She's right there. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a great opportunity to get outside our own world. We've got to keep doing it because our world needs us. And the people were heard to say, 